The Great Lakes storm of 1913 sank 12 vessels. The devastation reached from Lake Superior all the way down to Lake Erie. Ordinarily, even the worst November storms typically last around three days as they pass over the lakes, commonly known as a three-day blow. Sailors know that if they find themselves caught on the lakes during a November gale, the peak velocity of the storm will usually last around four hours, maybe five if they're unlucky. Five hours of heavy seas and winds reaching 60 miles per hour is enough to seriously endanger even the most experienced captains. On Lake Huron, November 9th, 1913, brought sustained winds of over 60 miles per hour for an astonishing 16 hours. With such a long period of sustained wind, waves on the lake easily exceeded 35 feet and hit with rapid succession, usually in a series of three that would relentlessly batter a ship. In the span of just four hours, eight freighters dropped to the bottom of the lake, most of them capsized by the sheer force of the storm. Not a single person on board these vessels lived to tell what happened in those final moments. But a handful of vessels managed to survive the maelstrom, most of them ending up wrecked on the shore after being blown off course by the whiteout. One even intentionally grounded in a desperate attempt to survive. Their stories offer a glimpse into the final moments of those who didn't make it through the storm, as well as the grit, determination, and the sheer luck that it took to survive the deadliest storm to ever hit the Great Lakes. But first, let's take a quick moment to talk about this video sponsor, Morning Brew. So I recently left my full-time job to chase every 14-year-old's dream of being a full-time YouTuber. Without a 9-to-5 to report to, I found myself waking up and spending way too much time in bed doom-scrolling through the news on social media, and it was starting to become a major drag on my days. I realized that I needed to cut social media out of my mornings, but I really wanted to stay informed. That's why I'm excited to be working with Morning Brew on this video. Morning Brew is a free daily newsletter delivered to your inbox Monday through Sunday. It's the perfect way to quickly get up to speed on business, finance, and tech in just five minutes. Instead of starting out your day with social media or long, dense news articles, you can get a witty, relevant, and informative summary of everything you need to know. Morning Brew has become a key part of my new morning routine, and I feel like it's always teaching me something new. Like the other day when they had a great piece all about Be Real, the app that I feel about 30 years too old for. I'm 31. There's no reason not to subscribe to Morning Brew if you're interested in business, finance, or tech. It's completely free and it takes less than 15 seconds to subscribe. Sign up for free by using the link in the description below or you can scan the QR code with your phone. I absolutely love it and I'm sure you will too. All right, let's get back to the Great Lakes. As trade on the Great Lakes grew, freighters that operated in the region developed a unique design, different from similarly sized ocean-going freighters. By the late 1800s, lake freighters were growing considerably larger as industry developed in North America and the demand for raw materials soared. The most common cargo was taconite, limestone, grain, salt, coal, cement, gypsum, sand, slag, and potash. In 1869, the freighter R.J. Hackett revolutionized shipping on the Great Lakes. The steamer was built with a superstructure divided between two islands. The larger containing the bridge was situated at the very forward end, while the second island was situated at the stern over the engine rooms. This boxy design created an immense single hold that's easy to access and load with cargo. And the forward bridge gave captains better visibility. The 208-foot wooden hold vessel is considered the first true lake freighter, and its design would soon become the norm in Great Lakes shipping for the next 100 years, even as freighters grew significantly larger and adopted steel hulls by the turn of the century. The unofficial title, Queen of the Lakes, is given to the longest vessel operating on the Great Lakes. On January 20, 1900, the title went to the 497-foot John W. Gates, by July 1911, the title would go to the 617-foot Colonel James M. Schoonmacher. Because of their size and the narrow St. Lawrence Seaway that connects the lakes with the Atlantic, most of these freighters are confined to the Great Lakes. While these designs are ideal for transporting cargo, they're not without their faults. In order to maximize profits, most of these freighters were significantly underpowered, especially when compared to similarly sized vessels designed for the open ocean. Lake freighters operating in 1913 were typically equipped with a single triple expansion steam engine capable of producing between 1,000 and 1,600 horsepower. Compare that to the Liberty ships built by the United States during World War II, 30 years later. 
The similarly sized vessels were powered by a 2,500 horsepower engine, and those ships were built as simply as possible to meet wartime demands. Technology in the early 1900s was more than capable of producing engines with more power, but smaller engines cost less money to build and used less fuel over the lifetime of the ship. Lake freighters were also typically loaded with the maximum possible cargo, using gravity chutes that left cargo like iron ore, coal, or grain in pyramid-shaped piles with steep sloping sides that left vessels more prone to rolling. This practice of carrying untrimmed cargo was heavily criticized even at the time, and it's a possible reason so many freighters capsized on Lake Huron in 1913. With all these factors at play, and the weather forecasting at the time only in its infancy, the challenges sailors would face if they were caught in a sudden storm would be immense. The storm of the magnitude seen on November 1913 was almost unsurvivable. By the afternoon of Sunday, November 9, 1913, the captains on Lake Huron were facing difficult conditions as they sailed north. A rough but not out of the ordinary November gale had been raging over Lake Superior and Lake Michigan for the past two days, but the storm appeared to be winding down as it moved into Lake Huron. It seemed a typical three-day blow. While the weather was challenging, it wasn't anything an experienced lake sailor would be unfamiliar with. Still, nearly all the upbound captains decided at some point during the treacherous run that it would be wise to reverse course and wait out the dying storm in the safety of the St. Clair River at Port Huron. On the bridge of the H.B. Hawgood, Captain A.C. May realized that he had made a mistake. Earlier that day, despite posted storm warnings, he, like so many other captains, believed that this was a run-of-the-mill storm, nothing that his 434-foot steel freighter couldn't manage. But as the Hawgood passed Saginaw Bay, it was becoming clear that going any further north would put his vessel and his crew at unnecessary risk, and he decided it was best to turn south and wait out the storm. Captain May was soon joined by 18-year-old wheelsman Edward Kanabi. This was by far the roughest storm the young wheelsman had ever seen. He braced himself at the wheel, using as much strength as he possibly could to keep his balance. The freighter was traveling light at the time, causing it to roll so heavily from side to side that Captain May had to crawl on all fours from one end of the pilot house to the other. As the storm intensified, visibility was soon dropping to almost nothing. In the whiteout, Captain May could just barely make out a similarly sized freighter still fighting its way north. Not long after, they saw a similar package freighter fighting along the same path. It was clear that both ships, the Charles S. Price and the Regina, were facing a dire situation, but things were only about to get worse. Visibility was already next to nothing when the sun finally set, plunging the whiteout into darkness. By now, an unexpected new storm front was moving in from the south, and the upbound freighters that turned south to seek refuge were sailing right into the most violent depths of the storm. On the 500-foot, 5,905-ton Howard M. Hanna Jr., Captain William Hagen couldn't even see the other end of his freighter as he struggled to determine their position. He thought that they must have been around 15 miles off Pointe of Arcs at the entrance of Saginaw Bay, but with no visible landmarks, it was impossible to be sure. Then a 70 mile per hour gust of wind pushed the Hannah into the trough between two waves. Two mountains of water on either side began to wash over her and she rolled and tumbled so heavily that her propeller kept lifting out of the water, making it impossible to get the ship under control and heading back into the sea. Trapped in an almost impossible situation, Captain Hagen desperately struggled to find a way to control the massive freighter. Then, when all seemed lost, he caught sight of a flash of light outside the iced over windows of his pilot house. It was the Port Austin Lighthouse, only a few hundred yards southwest of the ship's port bow. Immediately realizing that they were only moments from hitting bottom, Captain Hagen ordered his first mate to drop both anchors to try and stop the out-of-control ship. Her massive anchors dropped, but it did nothing to stop the Hannah's drift. Soon a massive wave shoved her broadside into the reef with her port side lodged into the rocks and the sea and wind smashing over her. The Hannah grounded only around 500 feet from the lighthouse. The conditions made it impossible to reach the opposite ends of the ship and her crew was divided between her bow and her stern with no way of contacting each other. The wind and the waves began to tear the freighter apart. 
Windows smashed in and her superstructure sustained heavy damage. Her hull soon cracked at the 17th hatch, flooding some of her holds. Even her funnel was ripped off and came crashing into her aft deckhouse. Throughout the night, there was nothing her helpless crew could do but huddle inside and pray for rescue when the storm finally cleared. Salvation must have felt impossibly far away. As the Hannah crashed into the shore, Captain May on the Hoggood was desperately searching for the mouth of the St. Clair River. In the whiteout, he grew more and more concerned that they were dangerously close to land. Like Captain Hagen, Captain May ordered his crew to drop anchor in a desperate attempt to keep them from running ashore. The anchor chains were let out, but even at full scope, they were not enough to stop the freighter. Captain May estimated that they dragged on another eight miles when he finally gave up on the anchors and resumed his search for the St. Clair River. Throughout the ordeal, 18-year-old wheelsman Edward Kanabi was using all the strength he could muster to keep a hold of the wheel, bracing himself as the pilot house was rocked violently from side to side. Exhausted and terrified, Kanabi was desperate to find a way out of the storm. With visibility gone, Captain May relied on his other senses and his intuition. Somehow, through the roar of the raging storm, he heard the sound of breakers and realized that they were careening toward shore. Following his instincts, as any captain would, May shouted to Kanabi to turn the wheel hard toward the open water to avoid running into the beach. Kanabi, though he was young and inexperienced, knew that if they took a hard turn back into open water, the mountainous waves would almost certainly turn them over. Whether it was thought out at the time or if it was just by instinct, Kanabi defied the captain's orders and let the huge freighter, shoved forward by all the might of the massive storm, drift straight into the sandy beach. They hit so hard that everyone went flying. Captain May claimed he was nearly thrown out of the pilot house. The Hogga grounded in the sand at Lake Huron Beach, just north of Port Edward. Their bow came to rest only 100 feet from the Lake Huron Hotel, which must have been quite a sight for the guests when they woke up in the morning. The crew sheltered from the storm throughout the night inside the stranded freighter. By the morning light, it was clear that if the Haga didn't beach when she did, they almost certainly would have gone to the bottom, like so many others. Whether or not Captain May knew Kanabi defied his orders, he never mentioned it in his accounts of what happened that night, but he knew that running ashore saved their lives. He was quoted saying, but for the crash on the beach just in time, there would have been another missing ship. The Hoggood and the Hannah were heavily damaged in the storm, but both freighters were eventually repaired and returned to service. Most importantly, their crews all survived the horrific storm. They were the lucky ones. The Great Lakes Storm of 1913 claimed at least 273 sailors. Captain May and Edward Kanabi were probably the last people who survived that night to see the Charles S. Price, the Regina, and the Isaac M. Scott before they all went to the bottom. The crews of these vessels would live the rest of their lives with the scars of that horrific November. Most would return to the lakes as the memory of the whiteout passed into legend, a new benchmark for the severity of a November gale. For those who survived, it must have been impossible not to think about those who didn't. Why did the Hannah or the Hoggood manage to survive when the Price and the Regina were lost? What made them different from their fellow sailors? What do you do when you witness the face of death? and manage to walk away. Every moment is precious. Our time can come in an instant. All we can do is sail on and savor what we have while we can. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, don't forget to help me out with the YouTube gods by leaving a like and comment down below. And if you like stories like this one, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and hit that bell to get notified every time I upload a new video. Thank you again to Morning Brew for sponsoring this video. Check them out in the link below. It's free and a seriously great way to start your mornings. I'd also like to thank my incredible supporters on Patreon. Their support helps keep this channel alive. Alright crew, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people.